Good evening and welcome to our 630 Bible study here at Lee Chapel African Methodist Episcopal Church. Uh, we are so very glad that you have made the decision to join with us for Bible study tonight. We know that you have a multitude of options when it comes to your online Bible study experience. And that's why we are so very glad that you have made the decision to join with us tonight. That's also why we always, always want to take time out to say thank you for joining with us tonight. We are uh, closing in on the very end of the book we've been studying for the past uh, few weeks and almost month of 1 Corinthians. And so we are going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13 tonight, looking at verses 1 through 13. And I would ask that you would join, join with me in prayer as we go into our Bible study for tonight. Gracious God, we thank you uh, for the chance to gather. We thank you, Lord, for the opportunity uh, to commune together. We thank you, Lord, for the blessing of this day. We thank you, God, for the chance to study your word, to learn more about you, O oh God. Bless us now, Heavenly Father, and allow us to feel the richness of your Holy Spirit in our lives as we go into our Bible study. Lord, this is our prayer in your Son, Jesus the Christ's name. Amen. Once again, thank you uh, for joining with us. Thank you for taking the time out of your day uh, to worship with us in Bible study. Again, we invite you to join with us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 13, uh, as we go through verses 1 through 13. Again, uh, we are happy to be here with you, and we're just going to do a very short recap as we go back and look at some of the highlights of 1 Corinthians in our previous Bible studies. Also, if you have not had the chance to be with us at every Bible study, you can certainly go to our YouTube page or go to our Facebook page that you're on right now and look at our old videos of our Bible studies and catch up with where we are tonight. But just again, a short recap as we go into 1 Corinthians chapter number uh, 1. Paul starts off uh, 1 Corinthians really talking about how important it is for us to realize that God's wisdom is superior to our wisdom, that God's wisdom surpasses our intelligence, that God is indeed wiser than we are. Now, why would that be important? Well, Paul knew that there were so many people who had learned so many things, so many people who had studied so many things that they began to think that their wisdom uh, was going to be a little bit higher than that of God. They believed and began to calculate how to figure some things out, how to find loopholes in God's laws. And Paul said, listen, God's wisdom is above our wisdom. The second thing that Paul wanted to emphasize was the fact that there should not be divisions in God's church. Paul discovered this when he realized that there were some people who were talking about the fact that since he brought them in to know who God was, uh, they might be superior to those who were brought in by, name of, by the man named Apollos. And so Paul said, listen, whether you've been brought in by me or by Apollos, does not matter. The most important thing is that you've been brought into God's kingdom at all. And so Paul talks about the importance of us not focusing on who brought us to know who Jesus is, but that we know who God is. Then Paul began to talk about this thing that was going on in the church where people were uh, not being considerate of the faith journey of others. So Paul talks about the fact that you know, we should not neglect the fact that somebody else may be a little bit weaker in the faith than we are. Particularly, Paul was talking about the fact that there were some people who were eating certain kind of foods without regard to how it might impact somebody else. So Paul says, listen, you got to be focused on and concerned about the fact that somebody of a weaker faith may be influenced by your decisions. And so Paul said we should always be concerned about how our decisions affect somebody else. Paul also began to talk about the fact that we should learn from the unfortunate mistakes that others have made in an effort to avoid those same mistakes. Paul said we should learn from the history of other people. Look at what they've done wrong. Look at what they've done right. And find a way to avoid those same issues and problems. Paul also began to talk about the fact that uh, love should be something we all should seek to capture. 
And we'll discuss that tonight as we get into chapter 13. But Paul also began to talk about spiritual gifts, about how all of us have been gifted by God something that would enable us to live a life before God that is indeed reflective of God blessing us and us recognizing that blessing. And so in chapter number 12, Paul talks about spiritual gifts. He talks about the necessity of people understanding the gift that they had received and how important it was for all of us to walk in the gift that God has blessed us with. And so in chapter 13, we'll also get into much more about the issue of gifts. So let us now read chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. I'm reading 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13. Let us hear the word of the Lord. If I speak with the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known, and now faith, hope, and love abide. These three and the greatest of these is love. Amen. May the Lord bless the readers, hearers, and doers of his most holy word. All right, so listen, Paul gives us a great amount of information to gather tonight, a great chance for us to dive deeply into this issue of love and what role it plays in our spiritual gifts. And so let us understand that Paul was writing to a church that was in turmoil, as we just did our recap. Listen, they believed that they could live their life any way they wanted to live. They believed that uh, some spiritual gifts were better than others. They believed that even though they were all part of the body of Christ, that they could abandon other people. They believed that because one person brought them in, they were superior to somebody else. And Paul had to put an end to all this. Paul had to stamp all that out. And so this particular chapter gives us great insight into what Paul was teaching because it gives us insight into this whole power of love. So let's jump right in and find out how this is going to affect and improve our lives. The first question that we want to jump into tonight is this. How does love re relate to our spiritual gifts? How does love relate to our spiritual gifts? Listen, in chapter 12, we talked about spiritual gifts. Paul goes line by line and says simply this. We all have spiritual gifts, but they're all given to us by one God. More than that, we are all part of the same body. And in addition to that, we are all called to live as a body. More than that, we are all called to serve one another. In addition to that, Paul also teaches that none of us should ever lord any of our spiritual gifts above anybody else's. What does that mean? He said, listen, the hand cannot say that because I'm not the head, I'm not part of the body. The arm cannot say that because I'm not the heart, I'm not part of the body. The leg cannot say that because I'm not the eye, I'm not important. Paul says our eyes, our ears, our head, our hands, our feet, all of our body parts are important in the same manner. Each of us is important to the body of Christ. No matter how old you are, 
no matter how young you are, no matter your gender, no matter your job, no matter your zip code, no matter your income level, no matter your education level, we are all important to God and part of God's body, and we are all essential to God's body functioning. And what is that body? That body is us. That body is the people. That body is all of us who are joined together to make this world a better place. So Paul asked the question, how does love relate to our spiritual gifts? Look at verses 1 through 3. Paul says this, if I speak with the tongues of mortals and angels but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. What does that mean? Listen, he says you can have the gift of speaking in tongues. You can have the gift of interpretation, interpretation of tongues. You can have that gift, but if you don't have it motivated by love, you're a gong. You're a symbol. You're just making noise out there. You can have the interpretation of tongues. You can understand what angels speak and what they say, but if you don't use that gift with love, then it's nothing more than a gift that's full of noise. Paul also goes on to say this, and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge and I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am nothing. I can have the kind of faith that could believe God for anything. I can have the kind of faith that, that tells me and instructs me to believe God for great and wondrous things. I can be in the place where I understand all the mysteries and knowledge of God. I could know the Bible back and forth, have scriptures memorized. I could quote them for you on any given day and time. But if I don't have love, I don't have anything. The quintessential part of our giving and our life is that it is motivated and undergirded and powered by love. In other words, I got to love you. I got to love you with the kind of love that God loves you with. I got to love you with an unconditional love, an agape love. I must have myself motivated every day by love to make love abound more, to spread more love, and to reduce the amount of envy, to reduce the amount of jealousy, to reduce the amount of hate. I have to get up every day seeking for new ways, profound ways, exciting ways to love you. I got to find deep inside of myself the love of God and take that love and spread it to you. Otherwise, what good am I? I can have pastored 20 churches. I could have pastored for 50 years. And in the, in the reality right now, I could be the pastor of Lee Chapel AME Church, but if I don't do it with love, then it's not worth anything. And that's what Paul wants us to understand that none of us can subject ourselves to operating in our gifts without love. Otherwise, the motivation is purely selfish. And we don't want to have a selfish kind of love. We want to have a kind of love that uh, is motivated by God. We don't want to have a selfish exercising of our gifts. We want to have an exercise in our gifts that's motivated by love. We don't want to have a situation where the gift that God has given us, as profound and as exciting as it is, it's useless because we don't use it with love. That's what Paul is teaching to us, and that's what Paul wants us to understand. It's very important to understand the power and how love relates to our spiritual gifts. Paul goes on also to talk about the behavior, as I described, the behavior of love. Paul asked the question, how does love behave? How does love behave? We've discussed the fact that if our gifts are not motivated by love, then they're, they're just wasted gifts. If our actions are not motivated by love, they're just wasted actions. So how does love behave? Verse 4 says this, love is patient Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. Here's the question. Are you, am I, representing God's love? Are you? 
Am I embodying God's love? Well, here's the question. Am I impatient? Are you envious? Am I boastful? Are you arrogant? Am I rude? Do you insist on your own way? Am I irritable or resentful? If I am or if you are these things, then in that moment in time, we're not representing the best of God's love. Now, here's the good news. It's not too late for you or I, or I to turn around from our ways. It's not too late for you or I to turn away from the way that we are acting and pursue a course of love. Paul says this, everybody can say that you love somebody. Everybody can say that you represent God's love, but the question is, are you boastful? Are you arrogant? Are you impatient? Do you insist on your own way? You say, well, not all the time. Well, here's the thing about it. We have to be in the posture of being more like God more of the time. Now, indeed, because of our own weaknesses and human frailties, there are times when we will give way to our own desires. But it should not be the case that I am less loving this year than I was last year. I should be better. It should not be the case that I am less loving this week than I was last week. I should be growing. It should not be that you are less uh, focused on God's love than you this month than you were last month. It should be some progression in our growth. You and I both should be in a place where we love more because we're motivated by God more. And we should dive into God's word more to give us strength, to give us the ability. Sunday I preached about how to increase your peace. And one thing we talked about was the fact that if you're going to increase your peace, you've got to find a way to let God be in more control of your life to have the heart transplant, right? To have the spiritual heart transplant. When I have a spiritual heart transplant, I might love God more. And if I love God more, I might love you more. And you say, well, well Reverend, I want to be better and I want to live a better life, but I just need more help in doing what God wants me to do. Well, let me tell you something. God will help you in that transition. God will help you be better. God will help you if you want to be helped. Like the man who was laying by the pool of Bethesda and was waiting for uh, the, the angel to come in and trouble the water so he could jump in. At one point, Jesus says to him, do you want to be made whole? Do you want to be better? Do you want to be uh, in a better position? If you do, then I will help you. If you do, I will help you be better, right? And in that regard, what God is saying is, he will help us be better and help us live a better life if we want to, right? Let me le read to you from Ezekiel chapter 36, uh, where God says these words. Uh, Ezekiel chapter number 36, uh, verse number 25. I will sprinkle clean water upon you, and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness, and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you, and remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. That's good news right there. Because what God says is, we got a heart of stone whom we can't love him, we got a heart of stone when we refuse to love somebody else. But God says, I will give you a new heart. I will take that heart of stone out of you and give you a heart of flesh. And I don't know about you, but I'm glad that God is still in the heart transplant business. I'm glad that God is still in the transforming business. I'm glad that God is still in the business of saying, if you want help, I'll give it. Amen? Amen. So then Paul also says this to us about how love behaves. Be patient, be kind, be loving. Don't be resentful. Finally, we ask this question. According to Paul, how can we see individual growth? According to Paul, how can we see 
individual growth. You know, when we do a self-evaluation, when we look at ourselves and, and, and are honest about how we are performing, uh, we must be uh, mindful of the fact that there's always room for growth. Uh, from time to time on your job, and for those who are retired, you also from time to time when you work, you might have got an annual evaluation or a quarterly evaluation or a semi-annual evaluation. And that's simply where your supervisor comes in and says, listen, we need to sit down and, and evaluate you on certain things, maybe on how uh, you come to work on time, uh, evaluate how much work you get done. Even I have an evaluation done here. Every year the stewards do an evaluation. They, they look at things about uh, Bible study and, and worship services and, and, and other things as an evaluation to say, are there areas for growth and improvement? And as I said earlier, we should all be different now than we were in a previous time. Even if it's just a day. I should be better on this Wednesday than I was on Tuesday. I should be better on this Wednesday than I was last Wednesday. I should have more love. I should have more compassion. I should have more sincerity. I should improve upon my life. So what does Paul say uh, in verse number 11? Let's look and say, see what it says. Paul says this. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish things. Now, notice, there's, notice there's several things first that Paul says. Paul acknowledges, as we should all acknowledge, that there was a point in his life where he did not function as an adult. Well, what do children do? Children get upset about not having their way. Ah, let's go back to what Paul says about how love behaves. Love does not insist on its own way. Children sometimes are not patient. What does Paul say? Love is patient. Sometimes children can be rude. They can push past you to get to where they're trying to get. Paul says love is not rude. Sometimes children can be irritable. When they're sleepy, right, they can be irritable. Paul says that love is not irritable. In other words, Paul says, there was a point in my life when I lived a certain kind of way. There was a point in my life when I did not uh, reason like an adult, when I did not think like an adult, when I did not act like an adult, and I recognized that point in my life. But now I have put an end or put aside childish things. In other words, there is now a point in my life when I've decided that I want to be an adult. There's a time in my life when I've decided that I want to be responsible. There was a time in my life when I decided that I wanted to take uh, God up on his offer to mature me, which means that if I'm going to be an adult, I can't go back to childish things. How important is that? Well, I'm 48 years old. I cannot fit into the pants that I had when I was eight. I still might fit into some that I had when I was 38, but when I was eight, I wore different size pants. When I was eight, I wore a different size shoe. When I was eight, I wore a different size shirt and jacket. I cannot fit into those clothes. If I were to try to fit into those clothes, I would do harm to myself. If I insisted on wearing those clothes, I would look like I had lost my mind. Same thing holds true for our spiritual nature. Why would you want to fit in the age that you grew from? Why would you want to conduct your life in the age that you were formerly in? Paul says that if we want to live the life that God has called us to live, we should seek to put away or put an end to childish things. Let me encourage you. 
to continue to live a life before God that God would approve of. And the first step we can take is loving each other as God loves us. I hope that this Bible study lesson has been beneficial to you. It has benefited me. Let me leave you with a few encouraging things and reminders also. Uh, please join us Thursday for our uh, conference call for our prayer call. Uh, Saturday also for our Sunday school. Be mindful also this Saturday uh, you can pick up your communion uh, on the side of the church under the canopy from 10 a.m. to 12 noon. You can pick up your communion for our online worship for Sunday. All right. We want to encourage you to continue to live how God wants you to live. We want to encourage you to keep living by faith. We want to encourage you to keep believing in God and keep trusting that God indeed will bless you in a mighty, magnificent way. Until next time, and please join us for service on Sunday. Until next time, may God bless you and may God keep you is my prayer.